Hello, I'm Mary Ellen Geiger, and i like to welcome you to today's MIDRIC seminar. Today's topic is a review of the MIDRIC MRAIL Mastermind Grand Challenge on AI to predict COVID severity using MIDRIC chest radiographs. The presentation will be given by Sam Amato, joined by colleagues Karen Drucker and Lubomir Hajinski. Sam Amato is an Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of Chicago, and the lead investigator for Midrick's Grand Challenges Working Group, as well as collaborative research projects focused on radiomics and machine intelligence for COVID detection diagnosis on chest radiographs and thoracic CTs. His research has involved the computerized detection and evaluation of lung nodules and CT, the computerized evaluation of mesothelioma tumor and response to therapy from CTs, the development of objective CT-based metrics for the quantification of mucosal inflammation due to sinusitis, and the evaluation of reference standards for computer-aided diagnosis research, as well as other topics. He is PI for the lung, he, he was a PI for the Lung Image Data Consortium Pro Project and is currently the faculty director of the University of Chicago's Human Imaging Research Office and serves on the executive committee for the AEPM. Lubomir Hadinski is a professor in the Department of Radiology at the University of Michigan. He has authored or co-authored more than 170 publications in peer-reviewed journals and been PI on NIH and DOD grants. His research interests include CAD, AI, machine learning, predictive models, and observer performance. He has co-organized multiple APM, SPI, NCI-sponsored grant challenges, is part of Midrick's CRP9, and as well as the Grand Challenge Working Group. He's co-organized Midrick's first two Grand Challenges, the COVID-X Challenge and the MRAL Mastermind Challenge. And we also have Karen Drucker, who has been involved in research at the University of Chicago for over 20 years. She is involved in many aspects of Midrick, such as CRP9, the Technology Development Project 3, the Grand Challenge Working Group, the Bias and Diversity Working Group, and many other committees of Midrick. She, along with Midro Lubomir, has co-organized Midrick's first two Grand Challenges and has previously organized and run Grand Challenges under the umbrellas of APM, FPIE, and NCI. So you can see we've got many, three top experts on Grand Challenges. So I pass now to Sam Armado. Great, thank you, Marilyn. I appreciate the introduction. All right, thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure for me to be able to present to you uh, a summary of our Mastermind Challenge, our Midrick MRAIL Grand Challenge, which was uh, intended to have AI predict COVID severity on chest radiographs. And again, on behalf of myself, Karen Drucker, Lumen Hajiski, and the entire Midrick Grand Challenge working group, including our uh, project manager extraordinaire, Emily Townley, uh, welcome to this webinar. So the aim of MIDRIC is to foster machine learning innovation through data sharing for rapid and flexible collection, analysis, and dissemination of imaging and associated clinical data by providing researchers with unparalleled resources in the fight against COVID-19. And one great way to achieve just that is to produce grand challenges, which is a major focus uh, of MIDRIC. Uh, through grand challenges, imaging grand challenges in particular, we allow a comparison of different algorithms, all playing by the same set of rules, using a common set of images as their input, reporting standardized output, and importantly, using a uniform performance assessment metric so we can do apples to apples comparisons, as opposed to much of what's in the literature uh, with a variety of these uh, things used throughout people's work and the ability to compare algorithms is not so straightforward. Through grand challenges, we are able as organizers to create a controlled environment, uh, a collection of database of images, a specific training testing paradigm, specific performance assessment metrics, and a specific reporting structure. Again, all designed to allow comparison, a head-to-head -head comparison of the algorithms that participate in these grand challenges. Our first Midrick Grand Challenge concluded back in November of last year. It was called the COVID-X Challenge. It was a classification challenge uh, to diagnose positive or negative COVID cases based upon chest radiographs. That was Midrick's very first Grand Challenge. And we're moving now on to our second Grand Challenge, which recently concluded earlier this summer. It is the Mastermind Challenge, as you heard, and this is designed to predict uh, 
COVID severity on chest radiographs. One of the key things with the challenge, I can't stress enough, is having a clever graphic. Uh, so thank you to Gillian and Emily for the graphics that you see here in this flyer that was used to uh, communicate and advertise the challenge. And an important thing also is having some sort of clever uh, title. And the clever title we had here is the Mastermind Challenge. Now, this is a great word that Karen came up with uh, to define this challenge. Usually we have these words be an acronym for something longer. And I had come up with this extensive title, Machine Learning Strategies for X-Ray Management in COVID. It was too long, too cumbersome. I was overruled. We did not go with that. We, we just thought with Mastermind uh, not being an acronym, but just being a conceptualization of what we're doing with this second grand challenge. So as I mentioned, the task in this challenge was to develop AI systems that assign an mRail score to chest radiographs, such as the portable image you see here. And importantly, all the images we used were portable chest radiographs from the Midrick database. Well, let's first define what we mean by mRail score to understand the clinical context of this challenge and the task that it involved. mRail is the Modified Radiographic Assessment of Lung Edema Score. It is scored on both the right and left lungs independently uh, by a radiologist. This is a manual process, hence the desire to have AI brought into this pipeline. For each lung, uh, a five-point rating scale is assigned for extent from zero to four, indicating none on the zero side and greater than 75% of the lung field occupied by disease, uh, which is the four. And then along with the extent, when there is disease, we categorize one to three for hazy, moderate, and dense. So there's a density score that's assigned to that extent. The same thing is done for the left uh, lung. At the end then, the range of mRAL scores possible is zero to 24, where we multiply the numeric value for the right extent times the right density, and add to that the numeric score for left extent times the left density to obtain that range of zero to 24. Obviously 24 being the most extensive disease and zero indicating no disease at all. So again, the challenge task was developed to develop an AI system that assigns an mRAL score to chest radiographs. To, to accomplish this, we use the MDAI system to obtain annotations for the reference standard against which participants' metrics would be evaluated. And we use the Medici challenge platform to actually conduct the challenge. As a performance assessment metric, we use the quadratic weighted kappa with reference to the mRAL scores that I'll talk about in a few minutes, how we came up with those reference scores. Uh, but this is the metric that was used to compare uh, the performance of each participant's algorithm with that reference. The training phase of this challenge began in April of 2023. The validation phase began in June, and the test phase ran for 10 days from July 1st to July 10th, where the um, participating groups submitted their dockerized code through the Medici system, which then ran that code on held back test cases. Winners were then announced at the AAPM annual meeting later in July. We'd like to thank the NIBIB for allowing us to offer cash prizes for this challenge, ranging from $15,000 for the first place team to $5,000 for the fourth through seventh place teams. The one stipulation to obtain those cash awards, however, was that teams needed to deposit their code on our GitHub repository. In addition, a unique element to this challenge is that the first and second place teams were eligible to receive MIDRIC support to take their models through the FDA regulatory process. Again, this is in the spirit of trying to help groups get their methods from the bench to the bedside. The first through third place teams are shown here. These groups participated in a webinar uh, in which they reported the methods that they used to obtain the results. And that webinar can be found at this YouTube link. I mentioned the reference standard. This is really a key to any challenge, getting an accurate, robust uh, reference standard against which to compare the methods that participate and against which to allow those methods to do training from the very beginning. So in this case, we enlisted 22 annotators. We had 2,079 training cases that were annotated. We had 197 validation cases annotated and 840, 814 test cases comprised this challenge. What we asked our annotators to do was to provide a single annotation for each training case. And that's not to say that each annotator did every case, it's to say that each case had a single annotation from one of our annotators. In addition, the test and validation cases were triply annotated. And then the median MREL score across those three was then assigned as the reference score for that case. In the process of providing annotations, the annotators also assessed image quality in cases that failed a certain level of uh, subjective image quality were excluded from the challenge. In total, then, we had 5,112 annotations 
uh, across the annotators and across this metric of singly annotated training cases and triply annotated test and validation cases. We were able to solicit radiologist annotators through the MIDRIC sites that are participating in MIDRIC as well as through professional societies. Um, they were selected on a rolling basis. And once they were went through, they were onboarded through a training video and that training video allowed them to understand the MDAI interface, how it's navigated and the features of the interface for providing annotations. And the training also allowed them to calibrate the task at hand. So to calibrate the assignment of MRAIL scores. And here's just a couple examples from that, um, that PowerPoint that was shown to prospective annotators. Uh, what we're seeing here is one example of how to navigate the MDAI system to provide their annotations on each case that was presented to them. And then what we're showing, showing here on the right, the top panel is a reference for the extent of involvement and a reference on the bottom for the density of the opacities within each of the lungs that are shown here as examples. This is just to make sure that all the annotators were, were aware of the range of annotations to provide to a range of diseases to try to calibrate them in the actual task of annotating. This is an asynchronous process. Uh, the cases that were annotated were randomly assigned to the annotators once they logged in and began a session that could have been a very short session, it could have been a long session, completely up to the annotators how long they spent in this process. But annotators were assigned cases uh, until we had fully completed the triple single annotation rubric for all the cases across all three sets of data in the challenge. At the end of this process, the, the numbers of cases annotated by any one annotator had a very broad range, ranging from only two cases to over 1,100 cases from one annotator. This is a snapshot of the demographics of the prospective annotators. As you can see, a majority of them were subspecialty chest radiologists, and a majority of them had over 10 years of experience in radiology. So this kind of sounds like organized chaos in, in a certain sense. Um, to the contrary, this is a way for us to balance the need for a robust uh, annotation for references with the efficiency of achieving that from volunteer uh, expert radiologists. And so we made sure that each annotator qualified to serve as an annotator based upon 10 initial demonstration cases uh, that were initially annotated as a reference by Carol Wu from the Midrick group. And each person was asked to provide for each of these 10 demo cases their assessment of right lung extent, right lung density, left lung extent, and left lung density. And what I'm showing here on the left is the reference standard from Dr. Wu, and the right is one of our annotators uh, and the reference, or sorry, the, um, the assessments that they provided to each of these categories for those 10 demonstration cases. In the end, we tallied up which e what each annotator did with regard to this standard reference. This is the number of uh, labels that were exactly the same as the reference. In this case, this person had 55% complete agreement with the reference. And this person had 7.5% uh, of their annotations differed by more than one category from that reference. So in order to qualify, each of our annotators had to have a number of differences that exceeded one from this reference that was less than 20%. Anybody who exceeded that level was, was not allowed to go on to the actual annotation for the cases used in the challenge. This assessment was rather arbitrary in terms of this threshold, but we wanted to have some minimum threshold standard by which we understood that the annotators were in some way aligned uh, with the task at hand before they actually provided annotations to be used in the challenge cases. So let's take a look at where these data sets came from. It came from, of course, the Midric data set. And here's a snapshot from this weekend from data.midric.org showing the extensive number of cases that we've ingested in, into this process so far. Uh, many of which are publicly available. And it was this database that we used uh, to collect the cases for all three data sets within the challenge. This is a brief overview of this process of ingesting cases into MIDRIC. Uh, two steps that are important for this discussion is the first uh, diamond, the sequestered diamond. Uh, we've been taking cases off of the cases that are brought in from contributing sites and using them and completely sequestering them for potential downstream regulatory compliance. So that initial group of cases is skimmed off the top. What then is left is analyzed for any potential challenges that our working group has out there uh, to be pulled according to some demographic distribution for potential use in a challenge. And so if we are looking for a case that comes through the pipeline that we could use for the challenge that has not been sequestered, that is then made available to the challenge work group to use to assemble uh, the challenge data sets. If not, 
in those cases become publicly available. And the cases, once they're used for a challenge and the challenge is complete, typically will then become publicly available themselves. So it's this pipeline that we've been using uh, to collect cases for our challenges that we've been conducting through MIDRIC. This is the demographics of the patients whose cases were used in our 814 test sets, looking at age, looking at uh, sex, looking at um, the percent of Black or African American and Hispanic or Latino. So race and ethnicity are all categorized here in the snapshot, snapshot of those demographics. This is an important component to the entire MIDRIC philosophy, as well as to the challenges we conduct through MIDRIC. And, and why is that? Well, because AI systems must be properly trained in order to reduce bias, of course. And there are a wide range of biases that can exist in the training of AI systems, in particular small data sets and patient demographics are two, one, two uh, biases that can easily be rectified through a database as large and as well vetted as the MIDRIC database. In addition, we want these AI systems to be properly trained for the real world. And this is where the demographics come in, comes into place. We wanted, wanted to ensure that those methods being developed for this challenge would be applicable to a patient data set that would be typical of a real world clinical situation across, across the country in, in, in general. And to do that, then our target demographic distribution was the US census distribution. And that's what we strive to achieve. And that's what gave rise to demographic categories I showed you in the prior slide. Turning out to the results, this plot here is a clever plot that shows uh, as a function of case number, the cases are ordered from low MREL score to high MREL score. And we see what those MREL scores are for all 814 cases in our test set. And so you see, for example, that there are just over 210 or 220 or so cases that had MREL scores of zero. And we see about uh, 30 or 40 cases up here that had the highest MREL score of 25 and everything in between. When we look now at the plot on the right, this is the median AI score for each of the test cases. So what we did here was to take the median score across all of the nine participating methods that that participated in the actual test phase of this MREL challenge, took that median score, assigned it to each case, and then uh, plotted that as a function of the same case ordering as we see on the left. And so uh, the, the key here is to, is to notice that the same trend is apparent uh, in this distribution, but is much broadened over a wider range of MREL scores. This is the single uh, winning team from the challenge, the, the first place winner. This is looking at their scores on the y-axis as a function of the MREL reference scores assigned by the annotators. Obviously, we'd be looking for things along the 45 degree line. That would be a perfect alignment. We see a range of distributions of scores assigned by even the winning team in this challenge. This is not, not a straightforward challenge. This is a complicated task with a complicated reference standard involving complicated AI systems. These two Blant Altman plots uh, are looking at, the, on the left, the median AI score and the reference scores, and on the right, the winning AI score from that single winning team, that first place team, and those reference scores. And so these are all the AI scores across all the test set cases, and this is just the scores from the first place team. And what's noticeable here is a very similar range of distributions of those scores assigned by the different participants in this challenge. We have a slight reduction in the bias uh, but comparable 95% confidence interval. So this again, was it was a complicated challenge. Uh, on the left is the final performance assessment metric, the main metric used for this challenge to determine the winners. These are our uh, teams one through nine ordered in uh, order of decreasing quadratic weighted kappas. The highest performing team received a weighted quadratic kappa of 0.88 relative to that reference standard and going down to the ninth place team of 0.74. Again, not a dramatic range of, of scores uh, and especially among the top finishers, a very small range of scores among those finishers. On the right, we're seeing a, as reference, the quadratic weighted kappa between the different annotators that annotated those test cases. And so we see those weighted kappas uh, slightly lower than what we were achieving through the AI systems. So there's obviously bias in interpreting these comparisons. It's not meant to be a head-to-head -head comparison, but this is just to give you a sense of what the individual annotators were doing relative to other annotators who define that reference standard for the test cases. 
So taking a look now at future directions, uh, Midrix Grand Challenge Working Group will leverage the successes and the lessons learned from these first two challenges for a, a broad portfolio we've got planned for future challenges. We're very excited about what the future holds for our challenge efforts. The challenges that we'll be using in the future will make uh, use, of course, of the robust Midrix data infrastructure and the extensive collection within Midrix of images and the associated metadata. Future challenges we're trying to develop are not just looking at other specific radiologic tasks, but looking at more complex topics such as explainable AI, bias in AI, and federated learning. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and myself and my colleagues will be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you. A um, lot of effort, interesting results, great future. Um, if you have any questions, you could put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, I'm going to start out um, having questions for Sam, Karen, and Lulamir. Um, as these um, uh, different investigators developed their methods for the challenge, um, and they came out with the performance level uh, you gave, and you give it in terms of the quadratic weighted kappa how does that translate to telling you how useful are these algorithms for use in, in the clinic ultimately? Um, I think many people on the call probably are used to ROC analysis with AUC. Can, can you translate that to potential usefulness? So let me start and maybe I'll turn it over to Karen. I think one of the key things with usefulness is to understand what it is in reference to in a real world setting. So in challenges, I think it's very useful to compare what the different participants' methods do relative to what a radiologist would do in that very same task. I gave a little flavor of that with that last slide, uh, but I think really to know that to know that real answer, Marilyn, it would require having some radiologists go through those same test cases and assess the MRAIL score and, and see how well they did compared to that reference standard that we established for the challenge. Karen, did you more to contribute to that? No, I, I agree with all that, that you said. I mean, it's important to note that, you know, even though we have like three uh, readings for each test case, there were different annotators. It were, there, were not, there were not just three annotators. So it's a little more complicated uh, to assess uh, the, the differences between human uh, readers and the AI versus human reader. Um, but further uh, investigation would definitely be necessary to, to determine uh, clinical usefulness. But it seems like the AI methods are very promising indeed. Thank you. And we do have a question in the Q&A. Uh, can you speculate on the applicability beyond COVID? Of, of challenges in general challenges. and sure. of the um, assessment um, I would say for this challenge where the radiologist did more of a rule-based radiomic type assessment of it and then added it together to do and give you an MRL score. Other ones might have input the whole image to some kind of deep learning network without doing that step-by-step -step procedure. So um, a lot of things going on, maybe applicability beyond COVID. Actually, the three of us just co-authored a review paper for BJR that kind of looks at that same thing. How do we take challenges and leverage them into clinical applicability and real patient care uh, going forward? And I think really it's accumulation of lessons learned, not just from the midweek challenges, but there are other groups out there that are very prominent in the challenge space. And I think collectively, uh, all of us are working together to, to define the best practices for challenges in a way that makes them applicable to the real world. Um, so I think that applicability for other disease states rather than just COVID is a function of the, the way that the challenge is put together, the robustness of the annotations, the robustness and the relevance of the performance assessment metric and making sure that is aligned with the specific task that the challenge is meant to address. Any other comments? Right. Okay. I would like to add uh, just something and not... Uh... That, that for previous challenges and also for this challenge, we we're planning to like see how we can combine models and see if we can do better. So that's more to do with clinical relevance, but also since COVID is largely, you know, uh, lung opacity. So one could easily envision these models being applicable way beyond the era of, of acute COVID. Uh, 
Yeah, exactly. As, as Sam was saying, uh, also, more or less, that was a great exercise to find a really reliable way to define the reference standards, to do the procedure, to do it really unbiased as, as much as we can. And I think this kind of procedure should be able to be applied to future challenges for different, different organs. Let me ask you both another question. I think we have a lot of people on, on the webinar, um, some who may have participated in challenges, some who might not have. What are the benefits? How could you, how would you encourage investigators out there to participate in challenges? Well, cash prizes uh, typically help, <laughs> um, but I think the, the, one of the biggest keys is to make sure that the challenges that we come up with, that the topic is exciting, the topic seems to be one that is really kind of pushing the bounds of what people's methods are are designed to do. And I think that that the challenge and the challenges should hopefully, hopefully um, you know, excite investigators to participate in, in future challenges. And they also, well, have access to the data, but in this case, um, I think, isn't there something on the Midra GitHub that can help people identify these training cases if they want to use them? Uh, I think use the, um, if you want to comment on what that is. And maybe you know, um, Yeah, I was actually reading another question and oh, it's sorry. only got half of yeah. the thing, but yeah, we have, uh, lots of material available on the Midrig Challenges GitHub uh, regarding cohort building for training, uh, training your model, for example. The annotations are there for this particular challenge as well. So, yes, there's there's stuff available for participants to get started. Okay, thank you. And I will read that question to give you both all three of your time to think about it. Um, Kappa is, fraught met, is a fraught metric, very dependent on the study set, not robust across studies. Is there a reason you didn't stick with bland altman and look at the bland altman limits of agreement between your reference readers? Um, we have, and the uh, Brandon Gallus has published on MRMC method for the bland altman limits of agreements, and he gives the reference um, comments. I think that finding a performance assessment metric is almost as difficult as finding cases for these challenges. And I think it's, it's you know, in, in a certain sense, you're trying to find a metric that is both relevant, that is robust, that's relatable to the task at hand, and that is a nice snapshot of performance. Um, you know, at the end of the day, th the best challenges would be one where the winners would be statistically significantly better than the second or third place uh, uh, performers and and most of our challenges, even this one, we, you, you unfortunately don't get that level of um, of distinction across the methods. So that doesn't quite answer the question, but it it gives you a sense of what is involved in coming up with these metrics for the challenges. And also, I, I think this opens the door for more involvement in the grand challenge subcommittee. In, right. Yeah. At working in the grand. Yeah. No. We'll ask uh, Brandon uh -huh. for some suggestions next time. But yeah. we, I also would like to point out, it did have actually another uh, performance metric as well. We also used the prediction probability concordance, but that was our sort of our secondary metric that was not the main metric by which the participants were ranked, but it was another metric that we uh, calculated on the back end in case we needed to break any ties, for example. Um, yeah. Always looking to grow and learn more things. So, um, okay, the there's another the, question. Oh, uh, go ahead. Sure. At the end of the day, actually, really, they are quite close. The concordance uh, matrix, actually, the weighted kappa, and even the Pearson correlation. I mean, we didn't see very strange, uh, I mean, outliers or difference in performance, which, of, of course, I mean, we saw the disadvantages of this matrix, more or less, in this case, was working. But okay, I think. Okay. Another question from one of your annotators. Is there some metric for how good our annotations were? How good were those annotators, folks? Right, well, right now we have not actually analyzed, uh, you know, on an individual annotator basis yet. We have all the, you know, we have all the scores, but it's, it's a little, 
for the the sets that were uh, triply annotated, we could compare, and we obviously have because we have we calculated the median score as our was our reference standard. But so the answer is is no, we do not know yet. We have not evaluated it yet, but um, it's definitely something we're looking into as part of a publication. Or if you're interested, no, we we definitely communicate it to you as a reader. And if folks out there have ideas for other challenges, please email this group. Um, always looking for good questions. Um, I have, um, unless you two want to make any more comments, I, I have one more question. Good. All right. Um, so as you do these challenges, uh, is the number of expected cases continuing to grow and what about the number of annotators? The, you know, of course, the more the better, but also if you have too many, you have to be worried more about the variability among, among the annotators. Um, it seems like you're constantly pushing the limit of how many cases you can get. Um, any comments on, do you have an end in sight? Uh, <laughs> the more the merrier, right? No, uh, there is, uh, I mean, it depends on the task, how many cases are reasonable. And we're also looking into maybe uh, for future challenges, having, you know, uh, helper AI involved in some of the annotations, helper AI, and then verified by radiologists. Obviously, you always want to have sort of the radiologist in the loop. Um, but yes, unfortunately, for test cases, uh, which comes out of a pre-published bucket, we're still always looking to have as large of a set and that, you know, a representative set. That's very important um, to have, you know, reasonable statistical power and a represent representative uh, sample. So, Lubomir? Yeah, actually, that, that's a great, very good question, Mary Ellen. Right, this is a, a strange compromise and balance, exactly as uh, Karen said, uh, the more the better. But then, of course, you need more uh, annotators or more effort from the annotators and how many. Uh, usually, probably, yeah, we have more annotators, sounds better, but exactly as you said, and maybe the variability increases because they are different experiences, different people and everything. But that's why the last challenge was very important because we tested that part, how many annotators can join and what variabilities we can uh, observe among different uh, annotations. Uh, and as Karen said, the future will be to compare the individual annotators, intra-observer and inter-observer variability for them also more kind of strictly estimated. But I think uh, even related a little bit to previous question, the value of challenges, that was one very important value. We, every, for every new different challenge, we are testing something else, and we are getting some additional mm -hmm. information, uh, information and some kind of more or less more realistic benchmark or planning for the next one, how, how to plan it, how to do it. And uh, yeah, it is, it is very, very interesting as we are talking for us, some future challenges. Exactly now we know more or less what we can expect, how many annotators potentially can come, and uh, also depending on the task, how, how complicated is going to be and uh, what we can get. All right, thank you. I really look forward to the year analysis of your annotators. Um, I think we we'll learn a lot from that. Um, there does not seem to be any questions. So at this time, first, I'd like to thank the grand, all those involved with the Grand Challenge Working Group. I think putting on these challenges um, uh, each year, it's a, it's a lot of work, a lot of creativity. Um, it's a great effort for the community. So that I'd like to thank NIBIB for um, providing the cash prizes for this uh, MRAIL score, MRAIL score uh, grand challenge, the mastermind one. I'd like to thank Sam and Karen and Lubomir for presenting with us today. And I invite everyone to go to midric.org to um, learn more about Midric and send us your questions and suggestions. So we're in. Thank Thanks you. for the participants, right? Yes, Participate of course. Next <laughs> time. Wait, wait, there's another question maybe. Yeah. Oh, can one serve as an annotator and also participate in the challenge? No. No. In fact, no, that's, that's why a conflict University of Chicago, interest. Yeah. yeah. That's why the University of Chicago can't participate because of conflict yeah, of interest. No. But um, we... 
But other than that, participate. There is there'll be prize money next time around as well. So you know, get everybody excited or come with some good ideas. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you all.